that's where it is. So, you know, that's, that's what I'm, you know, that's what I'm looking at. It's like, this is this opportunity. You need, you need infrastructure for people, not for oil companies. So, you know, in closing, you know, the kind of things that I'm thinking about is one is, is, you know, stay strong. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. Y'all got that message already. You know, challenge them at every, be diligent. Challenge them at everything, and you know, ch and, and you know, we need a lot of work on the paradigm change. But also, you know, don't have, do not allow yourselves to have ecological amnesia. I say this because when I drive across northern, you know, North Dakota, you know, it is such a beautiful land; it makes you want to cry. And what I can see in my head is, I can, you know, I can see it. I can see it. I can see the 50 million buffalo over there. It's single largest migratory herd in the world. Single largest migratory herd in the world, and they, they did not require fossil fuels to support them. 28 million cattle need fossil fuels. 50 million buffalo did not. You know, that is the, the, what belonged on that land. You know, and in that same ecosystem was 250 species of grass. Some of them were eight feet deep. And that's how you kept topsoil. The combination between buffalo and those species of grass. You know, and the resounding of those of those hooves as they would move across the prairie would just change in a whole ecosystem, the vibration that exists in the earth. You know, the same territories that you know in our territory further east that have you know billions billions of passenger pigeons. You know, so think about what this world was, and then also don't forget it. You know, don't forget it because one of the saddest things is when people don't remember. You know, like I don't want to be the people that say, hey, we used to have wild rice. I want to be, I want to be the people who have wild rice. You know, I don't want to be the people that say, hey, we used to be able to drink the water up here. I want to be able to drink the water. You know, and I don't want to be the people that forget that we had that. You know, because that is, you know, such an egregious thing to lose that. Matthew King, one of the great Oglala chiefs, you know, I had the privilege to know him as a younger woman. He said, um, I heard him say one time, he said, the saddest thing, it's the only thing that's sadder than an Indian who isn't free, a native person who isn't free, is an Indian who doesn't remember what it's like to be free. And I was like, that's it, man. You know, I'm, I'm not going to forget that. I don't want to forget that. You know, so for, for us, that is, you know, what this is about. You know, it's this moment in time, is I ain't going to forget. I ain't going to quit, I ain't going to back down. So, you know, in the, in the broader picture, of the rights of nature and what this means. You know, aside from this moment that we were all in, you know, because there's, there's not like a social change theory going to fix all this stuff for us. You know, that we're the ones that are here and we've got to be determined, we've got to put our bodies and prayers, our hearts on the line. You know, because things are not going to go well if we don't. You know, but in that, you know, there are a set of lessons on how you run your society and your legal institutions. You know, as I began, I talked about minimal modesty when you know, as being similar to the, you know, Bhutan, the Gross National Happiness Indexing. I, you know, and then the laws that, that go from that. You know, in economic terms, there's this economics now that I call about things, talk about things like interspecies equity. But we, we as humans don't have the right to everything. I mean, you gotta look up for the relatives. They have the right to interspecies equity, intergenerational equity, right? Precautionary principle. Something used widely in Europe as an indicator. It's like maybe sometimes the answer is just no. Just no. You know, I've raised a lot of kids. I've raised six kids. I got like eight grandkids, and sometimes the answer is just no. <laughs> you know, and that's. I mean, the thing is, is, like, at what point do we become such spoiled children that we think the answer might get maybe? And the answer is just no. You know, we need to quit acting like a spoiled children of a society that's entitled. You know, which we ourselves are. You know, a little bit. You know, complicit in. I certainly know. You know, in that teachings, of, you know, they have now, there's some of these economists that talk about, they talk about intangibles. <laughs> I don't know if that's the same thing as, as Rumsfeld's known unknowns or unknown unknowns. But it's like the idea is, so not all things can be quantified. You can't put a price tag on everything. You cannot put a price tag on everything. On everything. You know, and we need to really, you know, that's what we need to do is understand that. We need systems that are closed, that our responsibility is not, you know, leaked out, you know, or privilege put on others. 
You need an economic system that's efficient, you know, that doesn't consume more and in fact actually consumes far less. And through that you get something which has the rights of nature, which values more than the, than the rights of corporations. You know, about um, 15 years ago, my family and I, we went up to northern Canada, up to uh, what's known as, uh, um, you know, today is known as, uh, yeah, as Ontario. We went across the, the border, the medicine line, that's what they call that. Went across that medicine line and uh, was visiting my friend Al Hunter. And uh, he introduced me to his brother, because like, you know, he said he's got a sturgeon hatchery there. A sturgeon hatchery. I said, I'm going to see that sturgeon hatchery, because I'm really into sturgeon, you know. They're like, cool. Right? I go look at him and it's like these prehistoric beings, 230 million years old. That's a, that's a old species, you know. I'm cool looking and they're like in these, in these tanks. They're having, I guess they're having sturgeon sex, which I haven't quite figured out, but, you know, <laughs> they're like super docile, big creatures, and I realize they're kind of like the buffalo for the Nishinaabe, like so plentiful they used to be. You know, and you can pet them, they're like docile, they didn't like freak out like a northern, you know, you ain't gonna pet a northern anytime soon, right, you know what I'm saying? They're not, it's not a petting creature, you know. But a sturgeon was like, you know, it's like kind of like, you know, like, oh, okay, I got this one. So I was doing that, and so I said to my friend, um, so Joe, this guy runs a sturgeon hatchery. I think it's like the largest sturgeon hatchery in Canada. It's one of the largest in the world. But it says, um, they call him Sturgeon General. <laughs> I'm like, this guy, so I'm like, oh, Joe, the Sturgeon General. I says, Joe, uh, Joe, can I take some home? He says, yeah. You know, so I come back the next uh, week with, uh, you know, four Indian kids in my Aerostar van and some bubbly thing hooked to my car lighter and a cold cooler, right? And I go up there, it was like the same watershed, you know, I says, so I says, uh, so I get five sturgeon from him. And uh, I, uh, I put them in my cold cooler and I, you know, get it all hooked up and I says, so uh, Joe, what do I say when I hit customs? You know, awkward moment at customs, right? He says, just say that you're pets. <laughs> so, uh, you know, my family, I'm going to say, I did, I, it's publicly known the private, that we are prof profoundly good smugglers. I've been on both sides of the border for many years, you know, half my family lives north, so I'm like, I don't know about your border, man. You know, so uh, we bring those home and we'll put them in the lake. Put them in the lake. Oh, the Round Lake. That's where I live, Round Lake. So it's the last Indian uprising in Minnesota. That's what it's called, technically, last Indian uprising. I say we ain't done yet. <laughs> so anyway, but they're in Round Lake, home in Round Lake, and, uh, you know, and then uh, I go talk to the tribe after that. And uh, yeah, pretty much that's right. <laughs> and I was like, so I go talk to the tribe after that, and, uh, and I said, uh, I go talk to the fish biologist, his name is Randy Zorb, and I says, Randy, Randy, um, I said, Randy, uh, we, I put some sturgeon at the lake, and he goes, like, he actually went like this. He's like, Do you have any idea how many laws you violated? You know, and, you know those laws make no sense. This sturgeon are in our ecosystem. You know, they were violated, they were taken out. Our people lost them because our sturgeon clan has no relatives. And my sturgeon people are, are sad because we lost our relatives and we want them back. I said, so I'll put them in a lake. And I already did it anyway, by the way. <laughs> so then he goes, and like, you know, a couple weeks later, he's like up researching, and I find out he's doing all this research. And now my tribe has one of the largest sturgeon restoration programs in the region. <laughs> anyway. Hundreds of thousands of sturgeon, and every year my family goes out there and then, you know, my first grandchild was born 10 years ago. His birthday was two days ago. I said, my first grandchild was born two, uh, 10 years ago. And, um, you know what clan that kid was? It was Sturgeon. That was cool, huh? That was cool. That's how the creator does things, you know? So I said, hey, you know what? He was born a little dude. I, I says, uh, and, and then we go out there now and I says, there. See what granny got you? It's your religious, right? <laughs> so it's good, you know, it's a, you know, but it's this prep process where we reaffirm our relationship to our relatives. You know, and, and you cannot let them, you know, keep them. But I also did not bring the sturgeon back to have them run a pipeline across that same territory. Right you know, that's that responsibility you have to your relatives, you know. But so I take that seriously. So I, you know, I tell you that's the difference and you know, I stuck to that. You know, sometimes people get their feelings hurt when I say there's a white man's law and the creator's law, but that is it, you know. If you have a regulatory system that is run by a bunch of corporate criminals, you cannot tell me that's the law. You cannot tell me that's justice. And out there in North Dakota or Standing Rock we're called the protesters. I'm like you guys are criminals. You're terrorists, you're trying to destroy our water. You have to call me a protester. You know, I'm protecting that which is our value. So, uh, 
You know, it's this moment. We're all in it. I believe you got the quote. I, uh, when I was, uh, a couple of years ago, I was meeting my friends, uh, Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation. Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation on, on Pine Ridge. Remarkable work, Nick Tilson. So I was reading their annual report, and I was like, man, that's cool. I've come across this quote there. I like, call up Nick. I says, Nick, can I use this quote? It's too cool. Can I use this quote? He's like, Auntie, I've got to tell you where it's from. So he says, this is what he tells me his story. He says, a couple years ago, there was a bunch of us Lakota men who was in a sweat lodge. He says, we was in a sweat lodge, and in that sweat lodge, we, uh, you know, we was all complaining around before we got started and whining around about who did what, and tribal council did this, and, you know, talking smack. But for all of you who are not Indian people, I, want, I don't want you to think that Native people do that ever. <laughs> I was being a bunch of crybabies basically in there, so what was going on, you know. He says, he was down there complaining around, and I said, wait, then we got going on that sweat, and the spirit came into that sweat lodge. And so he said, the spirit came into that sweat lodge. And the spirit spoke to us, he said, well, already. he said, the spirit, this is what the spirit said. The spirit said, how long are you going to let others determine the future for your children? Are we not warriors? When our ancestors went into battle, they didn't know what the consequences were going to be. All they knew was that if they did nothing, this would not go well for their children. Don't operate out of a place of fear. Operate out of a place of hope. Because with hope, everything is possible. Time is now. Movement's here. Miigwech. Thank you for your time. <laughs>